Now, the crises of the, of the 21st century, if we just went back slightly to the 1960s and 70s and 80s, and you were to read a book by Heilbrunner, which I recommended to you before in the uh, prospect, Human Prospect, remember two lectures ago, and the Heilbrunner was a lovely little book and, uh, called The Human Prospect, and in it he, he, he presents the mood of pessimism that existed in the 1970s. The book went through every decade uh, a revision, but the opening forward is about the mood of pessimism and about the dangers of nuclear war and the dangers of the uh, po politicians no longer being trustworthy, about economic crises. So, so strange, this was in the 1970s, this is like now. He, he was so ahead, he not ahead of his time, but so much have we lived within this paradigm that things seem in some ways strangely familiar. He presented a view of the his front cover, uh, his, his emblem, was indeed of Atlas. Atlas who bears the world in Greek mythology. So it's a bearer of the world. The world is in difficulty and is in crisis. And the task of uh, politicians or statesmen and thinkers and so on, um, uh, the elders, is to bear up this world and, and, and survive. As opposed to the old images of Prometheus, remember? Prometheus gets the fire, gets the light of consciousness, or the light of science, the light of no knowledge, and steals it from the gods and is punished for that, isn't he? Remember his liver is uh, tied to a rock in the Caucasus and his liver is pecked out by day and at night it renews and the eagle returns. He goes through this terrible punishment. It's their version of the fall from the Garden of Eden, isn't it? That the, 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 the tree of knowledge that was gained by Prometheus or by Adam and Eve suffers a terrible consequence. And of course nowhere do we see that more than in modern technology and modern knowledge and modern military technology when the result of our knowledge can destroy us. Um, other visionaries, uh, we could pick out hundreds, but the, the ones I just picked out, are, first of all at random, were Carl Sagan um, from the 1990s, who was, uh, he wrote a, a, a famous speech um, in front for the United Nations in, I think it was 1995 or 6. Um, it was called Visions of the 21st Century, title of our, our talk. And in it, he talks about the, the great achievements of the human race in terms of medicine, technology, and economic growth, and the unity of the human race, and that our knowledge systems now are showing us that the human race is more united than ever before. We all come from Africa. We all come from a small band of, of, of people who left Africa. Um, we, we are united in our DNA. Uh, our consciousness and our religions is broadly the same. We are brothers or at least cousins. Come on, let's get our act together and be peaceful. And no need to bomb each other and kill each other and so on. He ends his talk with the note of warning about technology and science and military danger. Um, his recommendation is that the only answer to that, having unleashed this, opened this Pandora's box, the result of the Promethean stealing of knowledge, the opening of the Pandora's box and letting this out into the world, is that we now it's open and out, that we really let it out fully and we all become more com knowledgeable of science and knowledgeable of what's, what we're facing, rather than less so. Um, he wrote a famous speech, which is on YouTube, which I'm, I haven't got time to, to show you because it's going to take up a good five, six minutes, but it's worth seeing, and I sent you the link to it, called The Pale Blue Dot. And um, it's rather cheesy, and there's lots of background music and so on. But basically, and he's, he, he, he loves his own voice, and he loves his own grandeur, if you listen to it. And, uh, but it's great stuff. And um, he, uh, he requested NASA to turn around Voyager, one of the Voyager satellite, um, uh, spacecraft, uh, unmanned spacecraft, as it was leaving our solar system, and take a, the last photograph of the planet. Remember? Have you come across that idea? It's called the pale blue dot. And you see this section of the cosmos, it just all looks blank and grey. And if you look and look and look, look, you see a pixel, and it's just, that, that's Earth. Well, a view of six, is it billion or million miles away, um, the, the space voyager is just leaving the universe. So Carl Sagan requested NASA that they turn the camera around and take a last shot of Earth. Because he knew what he was doing. He got that last shot, and then he made this uh, famous speech, which is often quoted in United Nations and big, big, big events and so on. You quote Carl Sagan, and... Um, and you can see it on YouTube, of course, now. And basically, it's a very emotional 
our count of looking at the blue dot from a vast distance and saying, that's where we fought all our battles, that's where people killed each other, that's where we loved, that's where we hated, that's where, we, that's where all our lives were, and, that f and a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of that little pixel in the middle of nowhere. And all our fighting has been about that. You know, but it's the only place we've got, and it's our home. That's where we're from, and there's nowhere else to go in the universe. There's nowhere else in the solar system we're going to get to. We've got, this is where, he says, we make our stand. <laughs> <laughs> it's all great stuff. It's like American Frontier stuff. This is where we make our stand, and it's live or die here. So get your act together, you know. And it, it, it's lovely, you must see it. But, uh, ruined by the background music. Um, <laughs> so I'm not going to play it. The um, great stuff, Carl Sagan, great astronomer. Um, and very knowledgeable about the ecology and the uh, developing dangers for the Earth and the dangers of the military systems and so on, uh, on the money in the 1990s. Um, if we advance forward into the 21st century and just took out a few visionaries, the ones I wanted to choose really were ones that showed some optimism and some hope. Because, uh, as you know, there's enough pessimism uh, that we can dwell, uh, dwell in, and there's enough pessimism I can dish, it, dish out as well, as I've been reminded. Um, but it, do we have any answers to some certain fundamental crises like the ecological crisis, which is only one of our crises, right? But it's a very important one, and it's going to interact in a systems way with all the rest. Are there any visionaries out there who can offer us anything? Or is it just doom and gloom and that's it? Lester Brown, Jeremy Rifkin, Am Amory Lovins have all written great books, and some of them are free on the internet, and I've given you the links. And the most famous of all is called Lester Brown, Plan B. Great title. And in it, he suggests that um, there is a solution, um, that the analysis seems to be fairly clear and simple, and what it requires is an action program to put into place a series of engineering and uh, e ecological programs. So he analyzes three stages of debt, the hedge, the speculative, and the Ponzi stages. Mm -hmm. So the hedge period, Think of the lead up to the 2007 crisis. The hedge is when money is lent to the banking system uh, to people who can pay the principal back. You lend a million, you can pay the million back and also pay the interest. Hedge. And you make a hedge and you say, I'll charge you 5%. And so that will allow for a few failures here and there. OK? Hedge. Second stage, as the boom develops, speculative, as the frenzy comes in. The speculative is when money is lent out on large scale to people who can only pay back the interest and not the principal. How does that happen? Logically, well, people say, my house price is rising. If my house price is ri rises, then I'm going to be okay. I don't have to pay back the principal. It's going to be tiny in 20 years' time anyway, the amount I've lent, because the inflation is taking place. And the house I bought for 100,000 is now worth a million. So I don't care if I borrowed 80,000 and I couldn't pay it back. In 20 years' time, that'll be easy to pay back because I'll be a rich person based upon my million pound house. So the, so the inflation of the assets, in this case, housing, which a lot of us are acquainted with, but that applies right throughout the whole economy. Okay? The inflation is done on the basis of, sorry, the, the borrowing is done on the basis of anticipated inflation anticipated rising prices which will make you wealthier and allow you to pay back the money. So all the bank's worried about is if you can just pay the, pay the interest back for the, for the meantime, the asset will take care of itself in the long run. Getting riskier, isn't it? Third stage, the Ponzi stage. Ponzi, of course, um, uh, early 20th century, um, schemes that basically pulled in money and then uh, pretended to invest in it and then pulled in more money and pay people back from the money that's pulled in. So people thought they were rich. The word goes out and more people pour money into the scheme. But essentially, there's no real investment taking place and there's no real value being created. It's just more and more people are pulled into the scheme and therefore the people who control the money are able to keep people satisfied with the high gains they make per annum. But no one, very few people ask for their principal back. And that is robbed by the Ponzi people. Um, so the Ponzi schemes, there have been in plenty. But the Ponzi scheme is when money is lent out on a large scale and the banks or the lender doesn't expect the principal or the interest payments to be paid, but expects and hopes for rising asset prices for the house 
to rise. So the bank says, we'll lend the subprime people. They lend money out en masse to people who obviously can't pay it back. But what does it matter? Because their house prices are rising anyway. If they can't pay it back, we'll take the house off them and then we'll, we'll get our money back. So lending has become completely dislocated from any economic prudence, hasn't it? It's become totally speculative or really it's become Ponzi. So when that housing asset collapses, inevitably as most markets who have been inflated will collapse, then they're caught out and the Ponzi scheme collapses. Housing, in this case, the housing prices collapse or whatever the market we're talking about. And vast amounts of panic sets in and vast losses are made. These Minsky moments, these moments of great change when the cartoon character runs over the edge of the cliff and continues running for a while and then, woof, and then drops. These Minsky moments happen in the economy quite a lot. Finance therefore matters. A lot of economists have been taught for years, as I, I was, that finance was simply an intermediary process, a transmission system of pipes from lenders to savers at certain rates of interest. And it all seemed very logical and balanced and is built into the, all the systems we were taught. No one taught us, except Karl Marx and then later Minsky, no one taught us that there was a vast inflationary system happening which was destabilizing the whole economic system. And indeed, that's what happened. He published this in the 1990s. There's plenty of crashes preceding him, which he analyzed. Economics blindly ignored and couldn't build into their theories and never taught their students. So we had bankers at the very top, like Alan Greenspan, who ran the Federal Reserve, the most powerful banking system in the world, who was worshipped like a god, the great magician as he was called, and who was totally wrong on suppressing any regulatory control of the banking system and just believed it could expand indefinitely and it would be a self-equilibrating system and the bad money would be chased out by good money and it would all balance in the end and we'd all just get wealthier. And everyone believed him. And after the crash of 2008, he was called in as the head of the banking system, the greatest bank in the world, the Federal Reserve, and, he said, and they said, well, why did you tell us all this? And he said, I was wrong. And no, one, no one was sacked and no, 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 no one was, was even, even pilloried. They, they, they got away with everything. Uh, probably because most people just can't understand the money system. But the, one of the reasons why we can't understand it is that those people who should be doing the teaching of the economics out to the public at large have been taught in a particular system which has got blinkers on. They're around this big elephant called the economy and ecology and the system and they're, they're going, yes, that's because what have I been taught? Self-equilibrating markets, self-balancing systems and that must be the answer somewhere. And all this crisis thing, that'll sort itself out, push that aside for the time being. Denial, repression of the knowledge, sacking people or putting people out, out, out of their jobs who are complaining and, and bringing another worldview into, into matters. In other words, the 2008 crisis, the biggest crisis in the Western economies, and our system has en encountered a massive failure and is not able even to understand it. This elephant is in the room, is not a, we're not able to understand what has happened here because we don't have the tools in front of us. And Alan Greenspan and the like are totally at the centre of their explanations for why this has happened. So, uh, Alan, yeah. this trauma, this inner change, what, what, what's it going to be? We're going to see this in a moment, but essentially if we look at it as a systems point of view, it'll be a union of different systems, ecological, e economic and political and social traumas, which will all interact in a cycle effect, which is partially analysed, uh, Martin Weiss, um, in that link I gave you to Money and Markets, which is a remarkable website. Um, and in it, he suggests, from uh, probably a narrower point of view from what I'm suggesting, but nevertheless, as an economist, he has great vision. He's suggesting that there are these horsemen of the apocalypse, he calls them, um, and he calls them seven horses. I've added an eighth. Um, and um, uh, the seven horses of the apocalypse are ones which are working in cycles and which are gathering pace now and are unleashing themselves at this very moment. So what are they? The first horseman of the apocalypse is debt, the enormous debt of the Western world. It used to be said that 40% debt was the maximum any economy could bear. And we weren't allowed, the European Union said, no one is allowed to go beyond the 40% debt. Every country broke that. Britain has almost 100% of its GDP. That's the 
gross product for a year, GDP, gross domestic product, how much of that are you allowed to go into debt without being in danger? And it used to be said 40% was the danger point. Britain is now at 80, 85. Of, it, uh, of national debt, just national debt, the government debt, never mind the rest of our debt, the national debt compared to our GDP. It doubled during the economic crisis. The European Union has a vast range of debt. I mean, every country is way, way over the 40% uh, debt ratio. In other words, the West has entered completely into debt. And it's floating along as if very little is happening. Imagine going to a house to check its, the state of economics of, 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 of the house. Imagine meeting the father who's only working two days a week, the mother who's cr cracked out of her head on something, the sons who are um, uh, half unemployed and, 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 and interested in their music and things like this, and everyone's going on holiday. And you say, well, wait, wait, wait a minute, you're, you're only two days a week and you're a big consumer and you're this, that and the other and so on. You think this is, so many families are like this. And um, the, um, uh, how are you going on holiday? Well, we're going, we're credit, debt, you know, uh, that's how we're doing it. We've got credit cards. Well, that, that is similar to the economy. It's, it's no longer, it's technically bankrupt. The Western economies, and America particularly, are technically bankrupt. They're way beyond any rational, prudent measure of debt. Yeah. There's an issue there about whether you're technically insolvent or not. So I ran a charity that was technically bankrupt, but we had uh, we didn't pay ourselves for about three to five months, depending on who it was. And we said, so the money will come in further down the line. We can manage to get through it. We actually happened to do that. It was fine. Everybody was living comfortably, not going to pay. Anything. So it's when that it's it's that point when you're actually insolvent rather than just appear to be technically insolvent. So what is being said, I think, is that these debts will be ultimately repaid. And they say debts are called in by whoever we borrowed the money from. China. Beforehand. So there's, there's, there's three ways of, of, of the debt getting reduced. One way is inflation. If you owe if you owe hundred pounds to someone and you have inflation of ten percent a year, then in a few years time that hundred pounds is worth a lot less, isn't it? So the countries of the West, and Japan also, which has 250% of its GDP in debt, Japan is the most in the most danger of all. The, um, if there's s s strong inflation, then over a decade or so, that the debt you have is, in real terms, reduced. You still pay the £100 back, but it's worth a lot less. One. So you pray for inflation. Unfortunately, the West has not been able to create the inflation. It's, it's pushed huge amounts of money into the economies which should have created inflation, right? But it hasn't because the consumers of Japan and the West, including Japan and the West and of America, have so reduced their consumption after the fear of 2008 that that has counterbalanced the injection of the money from the governments into the system. So the consumers have reduced their, their uh, for certainly up to recently, their, con their consumption. That means that the money has basically gone into the hands of what's well gone into the hands of the banks first of all, and the banks have pushed this money into the stock exchanges and into speculative capital, and therefore the stock exchanges have boomed. So we've had inflation, but it's been the stock exchanging housing prices where the money is accumulated in the banking system and those who've got access to the money, but the rest of us have said, oh, I don't want to borrow any more money from the banks. I'm not going to spend it because that's dangerous, despite the low interest rates. So in other words, the inflation, which was hoped for, has only taken place in certain parts of the system, in stock markets and so on, which has benefited the rich people even more and created more inequality. So inflation is the first way you get rid of debt, but that's not happening very much. The second way you get rid of debt is that you simply say, we can't pay. Venezuela has just done that and said, we're cancelling the debt, we'll give you 10p on the dollar or 10 cents on the dollar or 1 cent or just go fish. Um, and uh, you, can't, you can't give your money back. So you can renege on the debt. Many countries have done that before. Argentina is a famous example. 
um, and, um, and can end up with uh, far, far reduced payments. So you can renege, inflation. Um, you can, um, if, if you're a country like, um, who has its own independent currency, European Union countries don't have independent currency, do they? They have the euro, which is controlled by the Central European Bank. Britain has an independent currency as the pound, right? It didn't join the euro. America is an independent currency, it's the dollar. Because the central banks and the government print the dollars and print or the digital currency and have the rights to do so, then they can print infin infinite amounts of it. As they print infinite amounts of it to pay back their debt and the social services and policing and keep up the infrastructure of a country, as they print this money, then it depends upon the people who receive the money and debt whether they, they will accept it or not. If you've got the dollar, then people basically say we'll accept it because the dollar is the world reserve currency. It's, you can pay lots of things in dollars. So that allows the, the government to get away with huge debt by printing dollars and therefore uh, offering that as payment for their debt and people saying, well, we'll accept it, even though the dollar is being relatively devalued by small amounts of inflation. So it's all based on trust. Trust in the currency. Yes. Really. When that trust in the currency collapses, and this is what Martin Weiss has pointed out, he says there'll come a, a tipping point, a turning point, a trauma point, when the, uh, these huge amounts of debt which are being created, basically the, the lenders eventually say, no, we don't believe you can pay this back anymore. Uh, we don't believe you can even pay the interest payments back. This has become like a Ponzi scheme. You're just creating money and we are giving the money back, but the money is de devalued or deflated because what we can buy with your yens or your pounds is less than we anticipated. When the, eventually the lender says, no, we're not going to lend you money anymore, then the borrower, the governments of the West, can, uh, they're, they're, they're what's called their bond markets. Bond markets is the government of government debt. Treasury bonds and treasury bills and so on. We call, it, we call it the bond market. That bond market collapses and government can't borrow money. Interest rates shoot up from very low rates at the moment to 7, 8, 10, 15, 20%. And the country then becomes even more technically bankrupt, even less able to pay even the interest on this debt. So it's just like the Ponzi scheme and the speculative and hedge thing. Initially, people are willing to get an interest payment for, the, for lending the government money bonds, then eventually they realise they're not going to get the principal back, but they're hoping for the interest. And eventually the government says, we can't even pay the interest. And therefore you get no money back. And, there, and, and, then, and, and, then, and then you have global panic. Vice, Vice reckons this panic is going to go from Japan, the uh, government markets, bond markets will collapse, to the European Union, and then to America. But in the meantime, the American markets will gain enormous expansion uh, as money pours into America in flight capital from around the world, pours into the American Stock Exchange, driving up the Dow Jones and the other indexes in America to unheard of heights, which is what is happening in America despite its economic problems. But surely um, there has to be a, an end game with currency, because if there's all this flight money, it's got to end somewhere, people have got to put their money somewhere, and if the chosen currency is the dollar, then people will have to, by proxy, continue to trust in that dollar to say everyone's in debt to, the ch to China, but China's put their flight money in the dollar. They've got to trust it because their money's in the dollar, so the dollar's not going to fall. So that's just my well, 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 wrong? well. At that point, if the dollar really, if the dollar really started collapsing, and it's the end point for, for yes, all of the currencies flow to the dollar for safety and security. Yes, that's correct. But if the dollar eventually collapsed, or there was a military crisis in America, right, mm -hmm. uh, bombing or something, and the New York Stock Exchange went down the drain, or something happened, uh, and the economy collapsed, and the and the political administration went to war, and you've got lunatic leaders in America suddenly taking over, etc. These kind of scenarios, which we're just beginning to see happening, thinking, you know, oh, uh, uh, there's captain of the ship, is he? You know, let, let me find another ship. Uh, well, that's what happens to money eventually. Ven money says eventually, well, actually, I don't feel safe even here. I used to feel safe here. We'll go somewhere else. We'll go to somewhere else where we feel safe. Maybe it's China eventually or something. Not, not at the moment, but or it's a basket of currencies, or maybe it's back into gold, or so, some, you seek security somewhere. But essentially, at that point, that tipping point, it's like 1929, and it's like every other crisis we've ever known, the vastly inflated prices, the bond markets, the housing prices, 
the speculative investments, the stock exchanges which have built up huge amounts of wealth and have, I mean, since 2008 they've boomed, even though the real production hasn't taken any advance. This speculative inflation will collapse and you get a terrific collapse of prices, market prices, stock market prices, bond prices, and you get a, a terrific loss of wealth that happens, like happened in the 1930s in America and Western Europe. It's a terrific loss of wealth. And, then, and, and, and prices reduced back to a level where they really should have been never left in the first place because of all the speculation which has driven them up. So it's a speculative boom that's going to burst at some point. The investment technique is to actually know when and to take advantage of, uh, and that's the real skill. I mean, any, anyone can say it's going to be a speculative burst one day. It's got to happen one day, that's for sure. Yeah, so it always has. But who can ride, who can ride the wave? And who can get out of that wave on time with their money intact or grown and be able to pull their money out and grow? Martin Weiss has given a lot of advice on this. He says there's a coming catastrophe with the cycles which are coming in. Money, debt. Money is the expansion of the money supply, which has been huge in, in Japan, America, Europe and America um, in, in the last, since the 2008 crisis. It's been the expansion of money supply by about $8,000 billion dollars which is a very significant fraction of global GDP. Inequality has grown during this period. Vast inequality has grown. I mean, uh, China particularly has had a tremendous boom, hasn't it? Its workers have actually increased. While our wages have s been stagnant for 10 years, China's wages have basically tripled in the last 10 years. The average wage in China has tripled. But yet, the inequality in China has grown greater than anywhere else in the world because the, the people at the top are gaining even more and more. So the and, and basically getting richer at the bottom doesn't make you happy if people at the top are getting a lot more. It creates more resentment. You, you don't get rid of resentment by, by, by getting more money, you know. People are always comparing themselves with other people. So the, the, the inequality that's driving the West and driving China and driving Russia, and particularly China at the moment, and, and, and Britain is very severe, uh, is leading to a terrific crisis. Corruption on a world scale, all the, all the measurements of corruption, we have better scales of measurement nowadays, have shown an increased level of corruption around the world. Division, political division, economic division, division between parties is breaking out in America, in Europe, just come back from Catalonia two days ago, there's another example, someone who goes to Poland, it's, it's also move, uh, strong movements to the right. Um, the uh, divisions in Latin America are very substantial. Divisions in, in Russia and China. The amount of divisions by any other measure, by any measure, are severe and increasing. The amount of tyranny in the world is increasing also. The movement towards tyranny and control is increasing. And the movement in the war cycle is unremitting. And five years ago, whereas no one could have talked of the scale of wars, like nuclear war and, and, and so on. Nowadays, it's become commonplace. The, the, the mood for war has changed substantially. And you can see the mood of these leaders, these leaders who have never known war in their own lifetimes, suddenly think they can start throwing these things around, pressing buttons and, uh, and beating their chest as if they're in the back of a jungle. I mean, it's just extraordinary, the changes on the global leadership scheme. And these people call themselves leaders, but really there's a crisis of world leadership. And the movement towards war is severe. What he doesn't mention is the eighth crisis, the ecological crisis, which we all know is leading towards an interacting syste systemic effect with all of the others. Weiss has done a remarkable analysis of these cycles that are happening and, s and he's claimed that they're all actually breaking now, the uh, coinciding of these cycles, the war cycle, the money cycle, the debt cycle, uh, which across many hundreds of years you can track and they are coinciding now for what he calls the apocalypse. However, he has good news for all individual investors. If you go to his website and invest <laughs> your money... <laughs> He's very, very convincing, by the way. Very, very convincing. He also gave away, three weeks ago, for your information, and I, I, I downloaded it very quickly, he gave a list of 300 investments and graded them to A's, B's and C's because they've got a credit rating agencies, which is one of the best in the world, Vices. And he gave away huge amounts of information about the investments that you should make and ones you should avoid and so on, with lists of companies and lists of banks and grading A star and B star. Phenomenal knowledge he gave away. 
it gives away a lot of knowledge compared to all the rest of them who make a lot of fancy claims but actually give away very little. Um, remarkable website, really recommend it. So finally, um, the uh, we come towards the end of this. Would anyone like to make any comments on the current crisis and their potential solutions that have been offered? I think I would advise that we recommend you to invest. 2018, 2019-20 in Europe, a collapse of the European Union. And then flight of money into America driving up the Dow Jones index to double or triple the level it is now. So he really, really recommends choice investments in the, uh, in the Dow Jones and so on, which he recommends. And then there'll be a crisis in America as the debt crisis hits America. And then it's time to get out and go somewhere else. And he's recommending where to go. He also recommends quite elaborate what's called ETFs, inverse ETFs. The stock exchange has now become so elaborate that you can bet against the flow of investments. So if investments were to drop in value, you can bet against that. It must call it an inverse. So an inverse means that you could do a 3x inverse, which is that if investments in, say, industries and metals were to decrease by 10% and you were to place a bet on that, then a 3x bet inverse would be you could gain three times the drop of 10%. You could gain 30%. And if you can understand ETFs and how they work, then he says you can make actually make a lot of money. And he explains it in his website how to do it. It's very interesting. But beyond that, even in the crisis, there are some investments which actually do well and some which do terribly badly. And choice companies usually do, 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 do well, no matter what the crisis, because they're well, they're well financed. They haven't extended their debts. They've got good management schemes. They pay their shareholders correctly. They're not based upon Ponzi schemes and so on. If you can find out what those are and invest properly, is that the European Union uh, has been a grand project for 30 years now. The, um, this grand project uh, structurally has reached the end of, its, of this particular cycle and might, might break up. Um, as that project begins to fail, its distributional arrangements, its lending arrangements, countries which are not going to make it, which have joined the European Union, requiring indefinite subsidies, um, etc., as the distributional arrangements fail and as the core economy of Europe begins to falter, as Germany has, economically and politically, then the project that was the European Union and that held all 28 countries together begins to falter. And various parts of that union then want to break away, like Britain, like Catalonia, like Poland and the movements to the right and to the left begin. And you get these extreme movements break out, which have lain below the surface of the great liberal social democratic project that is the European Union. However, I believe the European Union is just structurally set up in, in a way from the very beginning that it can't, it, can, it can't work. Unlike the American Union, which is set up in a way which can work. And therefore, when the crisis hits Europe, it's ill-equipped Ill to deal with the crisis, and then you get these manifestations of the crisis on top. So Britain leaving the European Union, Poland about to maybe leave or disobey the European Union, Catalonia uh, doing its thing, and so on, are just manifestations of the top of a vast discontent which is growing in the European Union, underneath which you have to analyse what's really happened in the structure of that system, which is not holding it together. In other words, the project that was the European Union is faltering, and therefore these are manifestations of the crisis. And we, we know from our and we know from our study of of of, 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 of Toynbee and other historians that there can be collapses of civilization, and that we have to we have to look at these things as possibilities. So when we talk about the decline of the European Union, it's not just a technical issue. It could be the collapse on a bigger, far bigger scale. These things have happened. There have been dark ages. Yes. Uh, there have been interacting systems of crisis for understanding the collapse of civilization, which generally include a wider range of things. Like he, he, these are just some suggestions from Vice. But if we looked at Lester Brown, you have these collapsing food supplies and water, water tables around the world, and you have um, a food crisis in, in, in the world, and growing populations, which also <coughs> have to be fed into this equation of the, of, of the current evolving crisis. The good news is that there are people there who, could, who say there are potential answers if only we could get our act together. Now, I believe that getting the act together is a political act. Yeah. You, you, you continually, I hate to sound like a leader, but you're continually describing 
from one frame or another the addictive cycle. And at the end of the end of the day, very much so. Stop using. That's it. End of the story. Yeah, yeah. And it, you know, it, it, you kind of pointed to it in the economic frame. It's not, you know, it's not that you have to give up economics. It's not that you have to give up money. You just have to run your business appropriately. Prudent. Yeah. Prudently. Yes, I agree. Fantastic, Jason. Uh, uh, J Jason's an expert on addiction, and I agree with everything he says. We're an addicted economy. We're addicted to lots of things, and that is a psychologically a very useful way of looking at the whole process. Mm -hmm.